thank you for the kind introduction and also for the invitation to present uh, some of my work here. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, non-lock-on cave sampling and uh, also focusing on some heavy tail settings and so on and so forth. Um, so just to give a very broad idea of the problem setup, um, so suppose that we are given a density pi uh, on the entire RD, uh, which is uh, in general like non-lock-on cave. So I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Um, our goal will be to understand the complexity of sampling, so to speak, by which what I mean is like, how many iterations should I run an uh, algorithm for so that you can get an epsilon approximate sample from the target density pi, right? So that will be the main focus of this talk. Um, I'll probably not be talking very much about any particular applications, but uh, I've listed some of my applications uh, here where this problem naturally arises. Um, so firstly, if you're uh, having to compute some integrals uh, in applied math area, it's very common to sort of uh, write it as expectation against particular densities so that you can just get samples from the density and then like do a sample average and you'll have an expect, uh, estimator of the integral. And uh, I probably don't have to talk about uh, the Bayesian inference application in this department. So there's a lot of experts here um, who, who know that uh, posterior sampling is all we do, sort of or one of the main things we do in Bayesian inference. Uh, but apart from that, there's also other places uh, which are quite unconventional, probably something you might not have heard about. So there's this concept called as differential privacy in uh, theoretical computer science and machine learning. So it turns out that these sort of sampling algorithms are also widely used um, to construct differentially private estimators and so on and so forth. And uh, I'm sure, uh, or some of you might have heard about like DALI and Midjourney and uh, also the chat GPT. So these, this, these things are the image versions of chat GPT. So there the problem is also like uh, sampling and this diffusions and things like that, which I'll be talking about today. Uh, are very widely applicable there as well. Um, so you, you could you could just search for like DDPMs and you will see a lot of applications of sampling to these problems, right? So our goal today will be more on the theoretical side and um, exact understanding the iteration complexity of sampling from a given target to the part, right? All right, so uh, here are some pictorial examples of the kind of densities that we'll be um, uh, worrying about in this work. Um, so sort of for the first part of the work, uh, I'll assume my density is expressible as uh, exponential of minus V. So, um, so I sort of back, go back and forth between assumptions on V and assumptions on pi. So if V is convex, then pi is log concave. And uh, if V is like strongly convex, pi is like strongly log concave and so on and so forth. But to move away from uh, log concavity, it's better to just directly talk in terms of pi. Um, so in, in, in this bunch of figures that I have here, uh, if you go from left to right uh, of the screen, um, you will see that um, the, the the function, the V function becomes more and more non-convex, so to speak, right? So in the, in the left side, it's a purely convex function. Uh, in the middle two figures, it's, it seems like a perturbation of a, a, a sort of a convex looking function, but overall the structure is non-convex. But then uh, towards the very right, uh, it's a truly non-convex function, so to speak. It can't be written in some sense as a perturbation of a convex looking function, right? So our focus will be more at the this on this sort of density, uh, uh, but I'll sort of briefly mention about the other two cases as well. And the most widely studied case is this, obviously, because it has more nice structure and uh, people have leveraged this, that very much to give some uh, theoretical bounds, right? Our goal will be to move uh, more and more towards the right. And uh, also uh, here's an example of a heavy tail density here. Um, so as you can see, if you go uh, here uh, and look at uh, oops, uh, either of these three cases, uh, the tails of the density is like growing much faster, 
right? Whereas, uh, I mean, the, the, the potential function is growing much faster so that the tail drops much quicker. Whereas here, the potential function V is like very flat, right? So if you do E to the minus V, it will be very heavy tail density, right? So in terms of like sampling, um, dealing with this and also dealing with heavier tails like this, both turn out to have its own issue. And sort of this will be the focus of uh, our talk. Can we say, say something theoretically about how to sample from these classes of this? This will be the focus of the talk, right? All right. Um, so the approach that we will take uh, is sort of motivated by the seminal paper by uh, Jordan, uh, Kindleher, and uh, Felix Otto from 1998. Uh, it turns out that one can view the problem of sampling um, as essentially just optimization on the space of densities, right? So the sort of advancement in the statistical community with respect to sampling, we're all focused on Marco chain Monte Carlo type of procedures uh, from 1950s and like uh, since the similar work of Metropolis Hastings and a few others uh, during that time. But uh, parallelly, or I shouldn't say parallelly, but around this 1998, um, in the PD community, uh, people were also thinking about the same problem, uh, but from a very different angle, uh, from a very deterministic PD type of an angle. And uh, only now, like people are really putting things together and using ideas from one field to the other and so on and so forth and developing a more complete picture, right? And the starting point of this story is essentially uh, this paper by uh, Jordan, Kindle, Herr, and Otto, uh, which sort of posits sampling itself as uh, just Euclidean, I mean, optimization, but on a space of density, right? So why do we care about this? So there's a very, rich theory of optimization in Euclidean space, uh, all of which could be leveraged to analyze sampling problems as well. So, and it turns out that literally, like in the last several years, people take an optimization book, oh, so there's this algorithm, or oh, what is the analog on sampling, or oh, you get a new sampling algorithm, it works. That's, that's really what's been happening. Also, there's this tool in optimization, can we use this tool to analyze sampling algorithm? And it turns out that it just works beautifully well. So that's really the, the idea uh, behind viewing this problem of sampling as optimization on uh, space of densities. Uh, and th th what, th what I call as this optimization inspired analysis of sampling algorithm, it's, it's an area which is starting to get developed on its own, right? And uh, I also um, cite this uh, ICML recent tutorial by uh, Korba and Salim. Uh, if you're interested, it, it gives a nice overview of, uh, and there's also a video associated with that. You can take it at that time, right? All right, so a little bit of more details. Uh, so let's just recall the KL divergence. So the KL divergence between two densities nu and pi, uh, it's uh, of this form, log of nu or pi times the uh, nu uh, dx. And uh, sort of, uh, we need to, so in order to do some gradient computations and optimization, things like that, we need to implicitly deal with what geometry we are working with on, on the space that we are optimizing. So if you are in a Euclidean space, you just do Euclidean geometry, so just L2 distance. And sort of the role of L2 distance or the Euclidean geometry on the space of densities is played by the so-called Wasserstein 2 geometry. So we don't have to get into the details of that, but what sampling corresponds to is that it turns out it's optimization of the scale divergence objective function on this W2 space, which is the set of all densities on RD. That is what is called as the Wasserstein space, let's say, uh, with respect to the Wasserstein geometry. That's really what Optimize, uh, sampling is from an optimization perspective, right? So in Euclidean optimization, you have an objective function, you have a geometry, and then you have a constraint set over which you're optimizing. So the optimization, the optimization objective in sampling is the KL objective. The space is the W2 space, which is a set of all densities. So it's an infinite dimensional optimization problem. The geometry is essentially the Wasserstein 2 geometry. That's what it turns out to be uh, the natural way to look at sampling, right? So if you're willing to 
take this perspective. Uh, so, um, so what's the first natural algorithm one one would have for doing Euclidean op optimization? It's the gradient descent, right? So, given an objective function, you can do gradient descent to minimize that objective. So, what is the analog of gradient descent? And let's just first talk in a continuous time. Um, so, the analog of gradient descent in the sampling setting is what is called as this gradient flow or the Wasserstein gradient flow, right? So the word Wasserstein, you just have to put it everywhere because it's like to denote you're doing infinite dimensional optimization here, but it's literally just what gradient flow on the space of this, right? And it turns out that uh, this is essentially, uh, 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 this mu t here is essentially a density and your goal will be that when t goes to infinity, the density mu t will eventually be pi that you want to target, that, that you want your samples from, right? So that is essentially the goal here. And, and this, this is what you will get if you're trying to minimize this objective function here using gradient descent type of analysis. That's the rough idea here, right? So, uh, and, and, and uh, why is this thing in blue here? So it turns out that this term log mu t over pi is what is called as the Wasserstein gradient. So in, in gradient descent, you need to have a notion of gradient. So in Euclidean gradient, you know how to do gradient of a function. So here, similarly, this log pi, grad log pi mu t over pi is essentially what is called as a Wasserstein gradient. It's an infinite dimensional object and it lives in L2 of mu t, right? So that's really the very rough perspective. So let's try to connect this to something that probably we have looked at before, right? So this seems like very different and like very unintuitive when you're looking at it for the first time, right? Because we are looking at the sampling problem, not as a random, there's no randomness anywhere in what I've told till now, but we all know like from statistics, like we were sampling from a density, there has to be some randomness implicit, right? So what do we know from classical sampling theory, right? So classically, what, how do we sample? We construct a Markov chain so that the equilibrium density or stationary density is like the target that you wish to sample from, right? And one such Markov chain is what is called as this Langevin diffusion in the continuous time setting, let's say. So it's given by the stochastic differential equation. So this V here is exactly the same V. Uh, the pi is written as e to the minus V. So it's exactly the same V that you have, right? So the information about the target is given to you here in, in, the, in this equation, right? So what is this yt? yt now is a random vector that evolves with t, where t is the continuous time, right? Previously, we had this mu t here. It is a density that evolves with time. Is there a connection between yt and mu t? A natural question to ask, right? And it turns out that the law of yt is exactly given by mu t. So if you take this Markov chain, continuous time Markov chain here, and look at the rand, so the Markov chain is essentially describing the evolution of the random vector itself. But this Wasserstein gradient flow here is describing the evolution of the density of the random vector. So they are indeed, you're looking at the same thing through two different perspectives. That's exactly what's happening. So the law of yt for this particular Langevin diffusion equation is exactly what is called as the Wasserstein gradient. So one is, one is essentially the density evolution the other is essentially the random vector evolution. That's the that's the only thing. Uh, that's the main thing connecting between those, right? So now uh, you you can take this perspective and construct. Uh, I mean, in in a way, you can use either of these perspectives to construct your sampling algorithm, right? And it turns out that what we call as this MCMC algorithms are essentially random discretizations of this equation here. So if you take this 
continuous time equation. So re recall that T here is continuous. So you can't implement it on a computer. So if you want to implement it on a computer, you discretize it in time. And that gives you the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm like Langevin Monte Carlo or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo or all this complicated algorithm or coming out of discretizing this SDE, right? But you can also take the Wasserstein gradient flow, which is the density itself, and try to discretize it. And that gives you what are called as like particle-based sampling algorithms. And they are they turn out to be deterministic algorithms. So there's no ex explicit randomness in some. So when you when you're directly discretizing the density, there's no randomness, right? So let me show an example to make to make it very clear. So you take your Langevin diffusion that I showed you before, do a Euler discretization, forward Euler discretization, and you get what is called as this Langevin Monte Carlo. So this, if you only look at the blue, uh, the the black part, and ignore the the last term, what does that remind you of? It's exactly gradient descent on the objective function b, and then you're adding this random noise here, and u n is some Gaussian standard Gaussian noise corresponding to the Brownian motion discretization, and this gives you what is called as the Langevin Monte Carlo. So, as such, this u n has nothing to do with the problem itself, you are artificially adding it in a way. So this is a randomized algorithm in itself, right? That's what I mean by randomized algorithm, right? So UN is something that you are adding to the algorithm outside of the data random, right? So that's why it's called as a random algorithm. Uh, and, and you know, all this proximal versions, metropolis adjustments, mala, and so on and so forth are all like advancements on top of this. So now this is an example of, um, uh, Sort of like a determinist, uh, sorry, randomized uh, sampling algorithm. And here is an example of uh, a deterministic sampling algorithm. And one, the, the name of this algorithm is Stein variation gradient descent. But I'm, I'm not going to go into the details, and talk is also not about this. But uh, I just want to put it here to show that uh, if you directly discretize the Wasserstein gradient flow that I introduced, the density perspective you will get an algorithm like this. So you see here, the, the grad V is still there. So you're only using still the gradient information about your potential, but there is no artificial randomness anywhere in, in this algorithm. So that's the only thing that I want to drive here, drive home here, right? So in the previous algorithm, there's an artificial randomness, uh, whereas in this algorithm, there is no artificial randomness anywhere. That's the main thing. So you can also sample deterministic, right? And then there is also this variational inference and so on and so forth. So instead of sampling with the entire density space, you can restrict your density space. And that is what sometimes called as like Gaussian variational inference. If you restrict to Gaussian space, if you restrict to product space, it's called as like uh, uh, mean field variational inference and so on. So essentially these algorithms are some, somewhat semi-random because you would end up having to compute some expectations in your algorithm. So there you need some sample average, uh, but there is again, no artificial randomness in these algorithms. So they are more optimization oriented. There is only, um, uh, so these are semi-randomized algorithms, so to speak, in, in this frame, right? All right, so now that we have these three different sort of flavors of algorithms, uh, the goal will eventually be, okay, so uh, for different classes of targets, how good or how bad these three different classes of algorithms perform, right? So that is really the table that you need to fill. And today's talk will be about some aspects of this table. It will not be a complete story, but some aspects. Yeah, question. Yeah, so the the it, it so it is hiding in Eto calculus essentially. So essentially, if you try to um, uh, we can maybe talk about this offline. It's a derivation. Uh, okay, so let, let let me briefly tell you one thing though. If you, oh, I'm going in the wrong way. 
this is the Langevin diffusion here. So if you write it in, self, in terms of the target, like not use the V, but use the pi, this is basically the score, like negative grad log of pi. So you see the log of pi there that gives you the KL connection. So any other questions? I, I, I'm not building the link. It's already there. I'm, I'm just expressing that. It's with respect to the T there. Is this is the stationary density? Yeah. Is the target? Yeah. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you will. I'll get to that in the heavy tail part. <laughs> You can do whatever you want. It turns out that this is sufficient for a class of targets. Uh, for heavy tail targets, you, if this is not sufficient, and you need to change it. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, I never told it implies unless I do just two different examples. This is one class, this is another class, this is another class, and this is another class. I never told one in class. Yeah. Right. Any other questions? All right. If not, uh, with this setup, right? Um, so we want to analyze uh, these different classes of algorithms. Um, and uh, so now, now comes this, the the uh, the assumptions that I introduced uh, the, in, the, in the figures. Um, so if the V function, the potential is convex, a lot is known, right? So it turns out that uh, the K, the the decay rates of all the mu t to the target and uh, everything is very well understood. And if it is uh, strongly convex, you have exponential convergence and so on and so forth. And uh, all these continuous time results, along with some additional smoothness assumptions on your target, uh, also translates to the discrete time result as well. So that is sort of well understood in the, uh, relatively. Uh, however, when V is non-convex, so most generally non-convex, I don't want to assume like an LSI or point pre or whatever. As I told, it is generic non-convex function, right? So how do we, nothing much less is known actually. For, for general settings. And that would be the target uh, in this talk. Um, and as I told, uh, much of this thinking is uh, motivated by optimization. So let's just ask ourselves, okay, what, what, what do people do when you're optimizing a, a generic non-convex function? So V is generically non-convex, no other, I mean, I'm not assuming anything apart from say some degree of smoothness, so gradient Lipschitz or whatever. So what is known? Uh, of course, if you're trying to find the global minimizer, you, you only get exponential dependencies. You run into NP hardness and so on and so forth. So only local guarantees are known. So essentially one can ask, can we do a local theory similarly for Marco chains or sampling as well? So we have an objective function. So we know exactly what you're minimizing. Can we converge to a local stationary point of the, your objective function? So that would be really like the motivation for this work in a way. So, and it turns out that uh, a, a notion of uh, local local measure is uh, just asking for non-convex optimization. Uh, I just need a point where the gradient is zero, right? So that's like first order stationarity condition for optimization, right? And it turns out that that's very well studied. So if you're given a non-convex function V with just Lipschitz gradients, uh, in order to get a point X, for which the gradient size in, in L2 norm is less than epsilon, the complexity you need to run for order of one over epsilon iterations. So for, for of gradient descent, I mean. So if you run gradient descent for order one over epsilon iteration, you will get the point uh, satisfying this bound here, right? So, so what is the notion of first order stationarity in sampling? 
So what is your objective function? Your objective function is the KL divergence. So if you take the derivative of the KL divergence, it turns out to be just the Fisher information. So our goal or our, our uh, sort of what we put forward uh, as a first order stationarity theory of sampling is that your algorithm should give an output such that the density at the output, the KL, uh, the, the Fisher information between that and the target is less than some epsilon. So that will be exactly our uh, idea. And uh, so the Wasserstein gradient, that's where it comes in. So the Wasserstein gradient of the KL is given by this grad log mu over pi. And uh, if you take the, the gradient of this, it exactly turns out to be the Fisher information, mat Fisher information metric that I have written down here. Uh, uh, so we just call it as FY for this talk, right? So let's interpret what happens here. So let's interpret what happens here. Um, firstly, it's a local theory, right? I just want to emphasize that it's a local theory. Uh, so let's consider this example here, where I have two Gaussians with one with equal proportions, half and half, and the other with three fourths and one quarter, but the means are the same. So it turns out that as long as M is like slightly small, I mean, slightly away from zero, the TV will never, the TV distance between these two densities will never go to zero. Right, so it's uniformly lower bounded by an absolute constant, whereas the Fisher information will go to zero when m goes to infinity here. Right, so for this example, so what it tells is that Fisher information going to zero is a weak notion of convergence compared to like TV. So it, so TV can never go to zero, but the Fisher information can go to zero in this example. Right. So, and that is exactly the same analog in optimization as well, right? So, optimizing, I mean, getting a point where the gradient is zero doesn't tell you anything, even if it's a maxima, local maxima, lo saddle point or a local, I mean, it could be anything in a way, but at least the gradient is zero and you need something more to have uh, uh, a local maxima even there. So here, Fisher information guarantee doesn't tell you much, uh, if uh, 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 for TV, for example, and without any further assumption, but it, it gives you a local theory. In a way, it, it gives you like a local mixing of Langevin diffusion near the modes. The mode convergences happen, but the overall shape of the density, you can never track it using Fisher information. So that is exactly what works, right? And there is also like a notion of past conditional mixing, uh, uh, which is a follow-up by Cheng et al. based on our work, which gives further so, sort of implications for, focused particularly on like mixture models of like convergence to Fisher information and things like that. So if you're interested, you can uh, look at that. And one last thing I want to emphasize here is that, um, so all the slowness in MCMC algorithms for general lock-on cave densities comes in through this metastability effect which means like you need to jump from one mode to another mode, right? So that's where the difficulty is in a way. So local convergence is really the right notion to think about if you're talking about like uh, general law concave density, because that, 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 is, that, that captures the, the convergence to the modes. The jumping between the modes is something that is implicit. You, you can never avoid it. So why, why do you have it as a, as a part of your uh, sort of way, how you judge an algorithm, right? So it makes more sense to look at local convergence. Yeah. So metastability very roughly means like the time it takes for jumping from one mode to another mode. So once you're stuck at a mode, it's, it takes time to jump to another mode. Uh, that's, that's roughly the physics notion of metastability. Yeah, yeah. So here it's a mode, right? We are sampling, so yeah, right. All right. So any questions before we proceed? All right. So if not, uh, let's quickly look at uh, this guarantee for Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm, um, and uh, so this paper is published in uh, Coles in twenty twenty two. 
So this is exactly the Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm that I previously introduced, written in a nicer way for, for, for simplicity. Uh, and uh, is it used in practice? No. But this is the first thing we need to start with to understand more complex stuff like proximal sampler, MALA, and things like that. MALA is probably something more widely used in practice, right? Uh, the, the, the two main questions here is like, what's the convergence of Langevin diffusion? Uh, and then past convergence of Langevin diffusion, does it imply convergence of the algorithm itself, the discrete time algorithm itself? Um, so in a recent work in 2019, Wempel and Vishano showed that uh, if your target satisfies LSI, uh, your target, uh, your Langevin diffusion uh, converges exponentially fast and it translates to convergence of the algorithm itself. Uh, and what is LSI? Again, LSI is telling you that uh, the Fisher information is lower bonding uh, the KL divergence. Uh, and if you, again, look at optimization analog, if you're optimizing a function, this condition of gradient, lower bonding the objective function is what is exactly called as this polyac loss asiavich inequality. So this is exactly the gradient bonding the function here. Fisher information is exactly the gradient of KL. The gradient is bonding the function. So these two communities came up with these co conditions totally independently of each other, but they have been using it to analyze their own problem. So, but it's all related. So this is one instance, again, that I want to emphasize of having ideas from optimization come in to understand sampling is very fruitful here, right? Uh, and there's a lot of work in uh, LSI, uh, under LSI settings and things like that. But our goal, as I told this, if you remember from the first couple of slides, we want to be at the very end here of like general non-convex densities. So the only assumption we make is this. The gradient of the potential is L Lipschitz. So no other assumption on your problem, right? And under this assumption, we have this following result. So if you denote by mu t the law of your uh, uh, algorithm, so here sort of t is uh, 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 interpolated version of your algorithm, so it's a continuous time. Uh, if you pick your step size, if you if you pick your step size small enough, uh, less than order one over l, uh, then it turns out that the integrated Fisher information is upper bounded by two terms here. So this mu naught is the density of the initial uh, random variable that, I, that you supply to the algorithm. And uh, n is the number of iterations. L is your uh, Lipschitz constant of the problem. D is the problem dimensionality and H is the step size. So you can optimize for H that balances between these two terms. And it turns out that that H is given by this. And uh, uh, so if you assume that the KL of the initial and phi is some K naught, you will have this bound here uh, for the integrated uh, Fisher information, right? And uh, let's even more uh, simplify this. Uh, so it turns out that, uh, K naught could typically be of the order D. Uh, it was shown in this uh, result by Vempala and Vivisano. So if you put everything together, what it tells is that in order to get a sample, which is epsilon close to the target in the Fisher information metric, you need to run your Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm for order L squared D squared over epsilon squared steps. That's what you need to, that's what this does, right? So it is guaranteed that if you run your LMC for these many steps, you will get a sample whose density is epsilon close to the target in the Fisher information metric. That is exactly what this result tells, right? And if you remember in the in the optimization world, uh, this complexity order was essentially like L over epsilon. So there was no epsilon squared. Uh, and there was also no dimensionality effect in optimization. So here you have both the dimensionality effect and uh, one order increase in terms of one over epsilon. 
So this turns out to be also needed for sampling. So this corresponding lower bound uh, um, uh, argument, which I'll show in a second, right? And uh, so, so uh, there are few other implications of this result that I want to highlight. So if you want to show weak convergence, asymptotic weak convergence of your Langevin Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, most ways that I know of uh, take your takes your Marco Chain Monte Carlo books, and if you open your Marco Chain Monte Carlo books, there's like half a page of conditions, like Lyapunov condition. There has to be a set in which it has to be a compact set, and then you have to hit that in a particular probability, so on. So with half page conditions, literally to digest, and under all those conditions, and if you all your stars align, you will have like weak convergence. That's what it does, right? Here, this is very clean. Only assumption is this. Under this assumption, you can have weak convergence of LMC. So that follows as an immediate uh, consequence of our result here. So if you pick your step size choice, any step size, in fact, you can let it depend on K and uh, all it has to satisfy are this bunch of conditions. So under these conditions, you will have the, uh, the LMC um, density weakly converging to the target as well. So that, that is that is doable very cleanly, right? Uh, yeah, so these are the other approaches that I know of, which has this half a page of uh, assumptions that you need to check to show weak convergence, right? And uh, now this is too general in some sense, right? So the only assumption is like, I assume my pi is like strong, uh, uh, um, Lipschitz gradient has Lipschitz gradient, right? Suppose that I have further information about my pi. Can you leverage it to get results in a stronger metric, right? And it turns out that one can do that. So suppose now my pi satisfies something called as a Poincaré inequality. So recall from the picture that Poincaré is like it still allows for a class of non-log concave densities, but it is still close to like a it's a, it's a perturbation of your true convex density or convex potential in some sense, right? So in this case, it turns out that uh, Fisher information is upper bounding the total variation itself. So if you get a guarantee for Fisher information, you're already getting guarantee for total variation under this additional structural assumption on the target pi, right? So, and that is what is called as a transportation inequality in probability. You can check uh, this paper by Arno Gulin uh, and few others. So if your pi satisfies a point inequality, then essentially uh, the TV is upper bounded by the fission information. So you can just apply our result and then get uh, the following guarantee here. Uh, so essentially in order to, if your target density satisfies a point inequality, uh, in order to get uh, epsilon approximate sample in the total variation distance from pi, you need to run your Langevin Monte Carlo algorithms for algorithm for this many iterations. That's what this results, right? And uh, around the same time, actually, there was another result by Chu et al. Uh, uh, who showed uh, using a different proof technique uh, that you can also get a guarantee like this. So in terms of like the D dependencies, it's worse here, but in terms of the epsilon dependency, we are worse here in terms of, uh, we have an additional one over epsilon factor, right? And uh, actually I do believe that the optimal complexity here should be D over epsilon. So both these results are off in some sense. Uh, Improving that is an open problem. Okay. All right. Uh, so, yes. E to the minus T. Yeah. So, that's right. Which will be our next focus. So, what if you have tails which are uh, fatter than like E to the T? So like poly D. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is an analog which is which is um, it doesn't have a name, but there is an analog, and people have used it implicitly in the proofs of optimization. Yeah, we can take it offline. It's a little more just uh, like more complex to describe that. Uh, yeah, but but it, it's it was it's not very well known actually. That's a good question. Exactly. Uh, it's an analog, in my opinion. So essentially, the grid. So in LSI case, it's easy to describe. The gradient size has to be uh, greater than or equal to the function value. So the structure is preserved. But actually, you can mathematically, formally make them equivalent. In the actual, you can do that if you wish. Yeah. So you just need to work with the Gibbs measure and so. The Euclidean optimization problem, you can cast it as, again, this is going a little bit away, but Euclidean problem can be cast as a sampling problem. Optimization can be cast as sampling as well. So you can use that. Yeah. All right. Uh, so now let's move on. Um, so how much time do I have? Maybe 10 minutes, right? Yeah. So, so far we have looked at uh, uh, general lock-on results, local convergence results for general lock-on cave targets. Uh, and then if you additionally have something like your density satisfies Poincaré, you have some results as well. And that extreme, the light-tailed extreme is uh, sort of well understood relatively. But in between general lock-on cave densities and Poincaré, there's a whole class of densities. And those are what are called as like poly decaying heavy tail densities. Like for your classical example is the multivariate T distribution, right? So how do you sample from like this sort of heavy tail densities? That would be like the next focus in the 10 minutes. And before we move on, uh, similar local convergence guarantees uh, we have in this paper for uh, the deterministic sampling algorithm SVGD and the Gaussian variational inference algorithm um, in this paper here. Um, so if you're interested, uh, so what I presented today was for the random algorithm. You can have similar guarantees for both the deterministic and the semi-randomized or semi-deterministic algorithms. So this, this local convergence theory is like really flushed out for these three different classes of algorithms. Right? All right, so now let's move on to the heavy tail setting. Um, so the canonical example that I want to want you to keep in mind is this multivariate T distribution. So just here, I've written it down for simplicity. Um, so it's like uh, this theta parameter is what is called as the degrees of freedom. Uh, this density is good for understanding because it is not sub Gaussian. It doesn't satisfy LSI. It is not sub exponential. So it, it is not satisfying point correct. Uh, so, and and in this work uh, uh, by uh, a student, Musawi Hosseini, and uh, uh, my collaborators, and uh, one of my students, EA, as well. So we show that uh, if you directly use the LMC algorithm, you are not going to do well for heavy tail targets. So it turns out that you will suffer from a D to D sort of dependency. So you'll not be doing well uh, for uh, if you are using LMC for heavy tail targets like the T distribution, right? So what? How do we do? Um, how do we proceed? You discretize other diffusions, and that's where the question that was asked. Like, so you can you you have two choices. Uh, the first choice is what I'll be talking about today. The second choice is actually done in another paper which is published in IEEE IT, but that deals with alpha stable diffusions and discretizations of that. Uh, so here today we will still deal with another diffusion, which is motivated by what is called as like weighted point rain inequalities. So these weighted point rain inequalities are generalizations of classical point rain inequalities uh, and were proposed by uh, Bob Co and uh, Lido uh, to characterize literally heavy tail classes of density. Right, so this T distribution is a canonical example which can be shown to satisfy this weighted point rate equality. Right, 
So now we're going to slightly change the parameterization of the density. So we'll be talking about densities of the form V to the minus beta because it is more natural to work with this parameterization for heavy tails. Um, so this is exactly the process that we will be discretizing. Uh, it's not the same as the Langevin diffusion process because here you also have a V. So previously you did not have a V here. The Brownian motion is still preserved, but here you have a non-isotropic Brownian motion. And then like there's a scaling coefficient here. So you have the grad V here, but recall that the parameterization has now changed. So we are not using pi to be e to the minus v. So pi is like v to the minus beta now. Then you're having the grad v here, right? And associated with this sort of uh, diffusion, so behind every diffusion is, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the typo. So yeah, so xt and zt are the same. So, so you can just think of this as xt. Uh, or, or, or this as Z, sorry, yeah. Uh, so behind every diffusion, there is actually like a, a functional inequality. And behind this eta, so this eta diffusion is naturally coming out of this functional inequality called as this weighted point inequality. So I don't, I don't want you to like understand what this really means, but it just, just one can, just keep in mind that one can show that for multivariate distribution, it will satisfy this unique. So that's that's really the running example that you can keep in mind. So now, if you take this uh, diffusion here and then discretize it, you will get this as your uh, discrete process. Mm, thankfully, there's no typo here. So, uh, so no, now this is exactly the algorithm that you're going to use for sampling from uh, heavy tail classes, right? So now we require some conditions. Uh, so again, so I assume my V to be twice continuously differentiable and then strongly convex. And then this is some sort of a smoothness, some sort of a smoothness condition on the V and so on and so forth. And now here's a mysterious constant delta. I'll explain what it is and where it is coming from after I present the result, but let's get to that in a second, right? So these two conditions are just, classical smoothness and uh, strong convexity type of conditions. This is the mysterious condition, right? So under all these assumptions, uh, one can show in Wasserstein metric that, uh, again, I don't want you to look at the, the ugly stuff here. So you will have like some nice stuff, like what I have written out in the bottom, I mean, uh, at the top. So if you are able to compute the A, C, B, and everything, you will you can explicitly write this bound and then get a complexity result. So and it could it will be worked out for specific cases later on, right? So now let's talk about this constant delta here. Uh, so it turns out that this delta is related to something called as exponential contractivity of this diffusion that we started with. So this Eto diffusion process. So so let me show you that um, in order for the Eto diffusion to converge fast to its equilibrium density, you need a condition called as uniform dissipativity. And if you work out some calculations, it will turn out that the uniform dissipativity condition could be represented using this equation here. And if you essentially have V to satisfy the other two conditions, one and two that I uh, enforce, it will exactly give you the third condition that that uh, we start, so that we also post, right? So this is essentially like a more of a technical thing. So there's no interpretation that I can provide. Uh, and I do believe that this condition shouldn't be there, but it, it, it turns out to be there for uh, the analysis so far. So under all these conditions, the result will true, but what I want to show now in the time that I have left is just work it out, work out the theorem for two examples, right? So again, let's go back to multivariate distribution. This time, my degree of freedom is d plus two. So it's not really heavy tail. So the degree of freedom is the order of the same, order of dimensionality itself. So it's not very heavy tail, right? So in this case, all the, so you can you can work out everything in the theorem. So the V is of this this form, 
beta is this, and then like your pi is this. So the alpha, CV, and delta, and everything, all of this could be worked out. And if you basically work out all this A, B, C, this things that I have listed here, uh, all this could be worked out and plugged in, and you will get an sample complexity of one over epsilon squared. So what this tells is that if you run this algorithm for order one over epsilon squared iterations, you will be guaranteed to get a sample which is epsilon close in the vast strain distance to the target density. The thing, the reason why I present this example here is that there is no D here. So this is uh, one of the very few instances of dimension independent sampling complexity. So this is actually a very fundamental problem. So gradient descent in the Euclidean setting for optimization is dimension independent. But actually in every sampling result, the dimension D comes up. So is there actually a dimension independent sampling or oracle complexity or not? That is a big un understood or ill understood question. Because in, in gradient descent, you have a dimension independent result. In sampling, there is no dimension, at least for the vast distance gradient flow stuff and things like that. But this is a different setup, but this is one of the first instances of a dimension independent result for sampling. Right. So now, but, but recall that this is not really heavy tail. So this is degrees of freedom order D. Right. So now you can do the same thing for small degrees. So I just pick the number three to get the four here. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll get a two point blah blah blah. So so it could be done for degrees of freedom two plus epsilon. So the result will hold as long as you have finite variance. The result will hold. Uh, so if you work it out for degrees of freedom three. Again, you do, do the computation and everything could be computed. Oracle complexity becomes D to the four over epsilon. But you see the effect of dimension coming in when sampling with heavy tail instance, right? All right, so that is really the, uh, the conclusion of my talk. So in this work, essentially we presented uh, a bunch of complex results for sampling from uh, general lock-on cave and some heavy tail class of densities. Uh, the first, that there is basically these two questions. So essentially, uh, you construct the ideal diffusion that you want, that you can use to sample from a given target, and then show or understand how fast it converges. So diffusion is continuous time, and then you discretize it and get an algorithm. And then the question is like, do the properties of the diffusion translate to the algorithm? And that jump is a non-trivial jump. So if you talk to probabilists, they will say, oh, it could be done. So once you have in continuous time, the result will hold in discrete time, but don't believe them. It's a huge jump. I can guarantee you that. All right, and if you if you are interested, I think you can go to this homepage and uh, find all the papers. And uh, the take home message in some sense is like, uh, optimization has a lot to offer to understand something. Uh, you can literally take any book uh, on optimization and then see, oh, can this idea be of use in sampling? And more often than not, it is of like great use to understand and study sampling algorithms. Right. right. So with this, I'll conclude my talk and I'll be happy to take any other questions. Uh, yeah, so it, it, it will still be small, uh, but it will, uh, yeah, so it depends on the problem, then whether or not it would imply anything for the other metrics of it. Any other? Yeah, so essentially, um, oh, sorry, I should go here. As long as your density satisfied, satisfies this inequality, 
this eta diffusion will have exponential fast convergence to equilibrium. It is unique yeah, under. So for for this class of densities, it will it will it will converge exponentially fast. That's why you work with this diffusion. What's that? So I'm working with this parameterization. Um, oh, I think I'm. So I'm working with uh, this parameter, like um, where do I do I have it? So I'm I'm working with this parameterization. So my target is like v to the minus beta, and then my my phi beta should sat satisfy this inequality here. Then this diffusion will have exponential error. Good question. <laughs> so, no, it's not at all obvious. I think uh, so. For example, it's also related to it's basically eto calculus. So you need to. Uh, th there is no recipe that you can like turn the crank to, to get this, but I think you can develop some intuition to to come up. So this is a non-trivial part. I just probably presented it in this way, but I should have emphasized that's highly non-trivial to. I don't, so, I mean, in, in a way, I believe every functional inequality has a SDE behind it. For, what I mean by that is like, there is, a, there is an SDE which would have exponential ergodicity for all the targets satisfying that functional inequality. But that coming up with that is highly non-trivial. For, for other ETO diffusions, what is the corresponding functional inequality? I don't know. It's an art. Uh, yeah, it, it is from this inequality, yes, yeah, we, 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 we designed. It's a particular ETO diffusion that we designed, yeah, which will, which will have exponential ergodicity uh, based on this functional inequality, and then you so you can discretize it to get the algorithm. So that's exactly what I present at the end here. Uh, so, so this is the, when does the rapid, I mean, when does the diffusion rapidly converge? So you have to come up with a diffusion which would rapidly converge under for your target. Once you do that, you can discretize it and then ask like, when does the rapid converge of the uh, diffusion imply something for the algorithm? So that is the next. So both of this you need to do by hand. The most well-studied one is the Langevin diffusion, but, uh, as we told Langevin, as should we probably show it doesn't work for heavy tail and we can set another diffusion and work. Okay. 